good to be with you all. It's always good to be invited back a second time. So that's, 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 that, that's good. So I am thankful for being here and bringing you greetings from our church, Grace Baptist. Um, also busy having the services at the moment. And uh, it's a joy for me to be here. I try and test the, the orthodoxy of the congregation before we start. So we'll, we'll test how orthodox you are if I say he is risen. Now, there's one or two Christians out there. That's great. That's, that, that is, I'm, I'm encouraged by that at least. On Friday morning in our church, we, we, we looked at um, asking, answering the question for us. Why did Christ have to die? Why was that necessary? And we looked at the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9 through 10. The, the creator, the, the all-powerful, all-sovereign, God determined in eternity past that Jesus Christ had to die. And we saw how this plan was always the plan from the Garden of Eden onwards. God told us in the Garden of Eden that Satan's head would be crushed, the serpent would be crushed. And we know that that plan of God was always to crush Satan's head through the crucifixion of his son, our Savior. And all the way throughout Scripture, we have this, this types, this, this analogies, this illustration, this, this forward pointing to this great cross event. We found out and looked in Hebrews chapter 9 that Jesus Christ's death on the cross was that which brought about our forgiveness from sins. It was His death on the cross that brought about our salvation. His death on the cross that brings about our sanctification. And it's ultimately His death on the cross that assures us of our justification. So we answered that question on Friday morning. Why did Christ have to die? And we saw these areas, these crucial areas, that allow us to stand before God, assured of His work on the cross, that places us in a right relationship with Him. Those words of Christ on the cross, that Brad alluded to, the, the tetelestai, it, it is done. It is finished. It had been accomplished. We have salvation. So in Christ, we are reconciled and, and we get to go home, we get to live our lives confident that because of His death on the cross, I am justified. It's a great confidence that we can have. But then the question remains, why the resurrection? If the death of Christ achieved all that we needed for justification, if the death of Christ brought about our salvation, why the resurrection? Why did Christ have to rise? If the death is sufficient to save us from our sins, why the necessity of the resurrection? Now, I know the easy answer is because God said so. You know, that great all-defining answer that my dad gave me. Why must I do that? Because I said so. <laughs> Done. Finished. No more complaints. Nothing else you have to say. In other words, God fulfilled His prophecy. The resurrection was part of God's promises. So that's why it had to take place. It was the great for fulfilling of all the truth of Scripture. But, but the question is a little bit more profound than a simple why. Why did God deem it necessary, in His wisdom, deem it necessary for us to visibly see the resurrection of Christ? We, we all know that Christ took on the form of the human body, took on a temporal body, the form of man. And, and, and Upon His resurrection, He puts on the glorified body. But the question we have is, why did He rise physically from the dead? Why is it necessary in our theology? 
Why is it necessary for our belief system, our worldview, for the tomb to be empty? Now, on one hand, we understand that it is the fact or the truth of the tomb that sets us apart from all other religions, all other false worship out there, so-called religions. Because we serve the only true and living God, it sets us apart. We do not serve some dead person, some person in the grave, whether it be Joseph Smith, whether it be Muhammad, whether it be Buddha and, and any other false God out there. All of them have one thing in common, apart from being false and heretical, is that they are all in their grave. Christ, Christians serve a risen Savior, one who has overcome death, one who hasn't succumbed to the wages of sin. And, and that makes us unique, makes our theology unique. Every year, thousands of people join their friends to see the graves of these leaders, these dead, stinking, decayed bodies. But as Christians, we're different. Why? Because he rose. But, but that cannot be the only reason he rose. It's, it's not only a, a reason to, to, for the whole resurrection to have taken place, just so that we might serve a living God. That is the truth of his rise, not necessarily the reason of his rising. So this morning I want to answer that question for us. And we're going to answer it by taking a look at 1 Peter chapter 1. You can turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. As we look at that portion of Scripture, as we look at this, the power of the resurrection, as it were, on Friday in our church, and I'm sure in your church as well, we, we looked and saw the power of the cross. Today we can look at the power of the resurrection. Unfortunately, there's no song with that title, but we can work on that, I'm sure. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontius and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, according to the full knowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through this faith for our salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and the glory and the honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what personal time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Can we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we pray now as we open your word this morning that you would quieten our hearts about the concerns of this world, but that through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us, that you would allow the word of God to resonate, to convict to encourage and to shepherd us for your glory, all in accordance with your word. 
We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Simple answer to the question, why the resurrection? I believe that two main reasons, and just so you know, it's not a two-point sermon. There's more points coming. But I'll just give you the answer so that in case you're not, if you have the answer at least. First of all, the resurrection had to take place to assure us of our own resurrection. And then it had to take place to fuel us to live a life for His glory. Those two main points. Peter, the apostle, writes this letter to the church. Peter, one of Christ's leading apostles. In fact, Peter's name is mentioned first on the list all the way through the gospel accounts. There's, there's more information about Peter than any of the other disciples. He's a prominent disciple, originally known as Simon or, or Simeon. Christ changes his name to Petros. That great passage and he says, your name shall be Petros, Peter, and upon this I will build my church, not on Peter himself, but on the public proclamation of who Christ is that Peter does. Peter's also the one that denies Christ during the crucifixion. Are, are, are you not with him? I don't know the guy. Are you not one of them? Get, I, I have no clue who he is. G get away from me. I want nothing to do with that man. But Peter is also the spokesperson during the early church. In fact, Acts chapter 1 through 12 is all about Peter's ministry. He becomes the most prolific preacher of the early church. The, the one that preaches the first gospel message, as it were. 3,000 respond at one time. This is who Peter is. And Peter writes to these group of believers. Shortly, or around AD 64-65, in July of 64, Rome burnt down. Great fire destruction, Rome. The Romans themselves believed that Emperor, I mean, that Nero, their emperor, actually burnt the city down as well. He had this wonderful uh, passion to build new things. And in order to build new things, he needed to get rid of some of the old things. So he himself burns the city down. The Romans were totally devastated by what had taken place. In a sense, their entire culture had been changed. Their, their temples, their shrines, and even their household idols had, had been destroyed in the fire. And, and this had great religious implications to them because just like what took place in the nation of Israel, the, the Romans said, well, if our gods were not able to stop this, what, what god are we serving? And they began, they began to doubt, and there was great pain, bitter resentment, People were homeless. People were helpless. Many had lost family friends. And there was this bitter resentment that was rising up at the time against Nero. So Nero found himself a scapegoat. And he found himself a very easy scapegoat. He simply directed it to the Christians and began the rumor that it was the Christians that had set Rome on fire. It was the Christians that tried to burn it down. It was easy to point towards the Christians because they were disliked in any case because they were friends of the Jewish people. They were considered a sect of Judaism. And because most people said they don't like us in any case because they go against all of our cultures. They say what we believe is wrong. So there was this great hatred for the Christians fueled by the fire and fueled by Nero's false accusations. So what happens is, is that the believers begin to feel the full brunt of persecution that comes their way. Everybody turns on them. And they are slowly but surely martyred, maligned, and forced out of their homes simply because they are Christians. Simply because they say, we trust in Jesus Christ they were being killed. In fact, they were being used to light up the games at night. Their bodies dipped in wax and put on poles and burnt so they could illuminate the games. 
strung, crucified along the highways simply because they were Christians. As a result of that, great dispersion takes place. And they try and move all the way through Asia Minor. So you can imagine who the audience is here. Peter is writing to a bunch of Christians, mostly from Gentile background, who have been flung all across Asia Minor because people want to kill them wherever they go. Simply for saying that we are Christians. So the Apostle Peter writes to them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in order to encourage them. Encourage them to continue. Folks, lest we think that is foreign, I don't think we are too far away from the similar maligning that takes place in the world today. Christians are increasingly considered to be narrow-minded, increasingly considered to be out of touch with reality. Our worldview has been shunned and joked about. Think of the persecution taking place all across the world. In fact, more people have died in the last five years because of their Christian belief than in the previous hundred years of history. So he writes to them so they might not lose hope, that they might not become bitter, that they would continue to trust in the Lord. Continue to look for His second coming. In fact, the entire epistle is an epistle of hope. And this is how the hope goes. Continue to live for Christ. Continue to trust in Christ and in His message. Despite what's happening to you. Despite the persecution. So that you might, through your obedient conduct, bring glory to Christ. It's a great message, isn't it? Let's continue to hold on to Christ. So that despite our persecution, He might be glorified. In fact, you see this all the way through the epistle. Verse 14, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as He who is called you is holy, you be holy in all your conduct. As you are facing persecution, be holy. <laughs> As they drag your husband off to be martyred, you be holy. Chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope in you, yet with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Have a hope within you. Even when you're slandered, have this hope. So Peter's emphasis is on that of restoring hope, allowing the pilgrims to focus on the work of Christ, the work of God, and be encouraged to hope. So how do you begin to encourage Christians to hold on despite persecution? How do you begin to give them a foundation for what successful or conquering Christian life looks like in the midst of persecution? What is the anchor? What is the foundation that gives power to that? Well, I'm I'm glad you asked. Because notice what Peter does in chapter 1. Peter's emphasis of restoring hope is fully focused on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is that event that fuels his entire message. Notice how he starts out. We're going to see that Christ's resurrection demonstrates God's mercy. Right? So you'll see today, I'm not a very good Baptist. I haven't got three points in a poem. It's four points today, okay? I think a little bit, I'm more OCD. Four points works better for my my mind. The first one is Christ's resurrection demonstrates God's mercy. 
Notice after this greeting, this, this massive greeting, verse 1 and 2, which is an entire sermon series alone. But Peter begins to move on to that which is meant to cast their eyes towards God and His power. He says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, this is talking about God now, God, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. How has He caused us to be born again to a living hope? That is the text. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So our living hope is firmly rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But he starts out by saying, blessed be God. This is a dual title. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. A, a double barrel title which gives us the humanity of Christ as well as the deity of Christ. He's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's His humanity. As well as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, His deity. Blessed be God who has caused us, made it possible for us to be born again. The, the aim is to have God lifted up, His name to be blessed, because of His great mercy. According to His great mercy. It is God who according to His manifold, that word great there is literally mega, unbelievable, huge, great mercy, that God has caused us to be born again. The mercy is a form of love that is determined by the state or condition of the objects. Love, it's easy to love those who love you. It's easy to love those who are lovable. It takes a lot of mercy to love those who are unlovable. I tell this to my children on a regular basis. I love them when they are lovable. It's much harder to love them when they are unlovable. I have seven children, so I go through all of those on a regular basis. What God says, despite their state, God, despite their unworthy, ill-deserving state, God understands their lost and their miserable condition. God understands that they are lost outside of Him. But despite that, He looks at us with great mercy in our desperate situation and He allows us or brings us New birth. He causes us. He's, he's the root. He's the action. He causes us to be born again. We all know for the wages of sin is death. We all know that we all fall short of the glory of God. We all know that we are surely going to die. But God in His mercy says, I want them to have life. And I want them to be relieved from that situation. And the God who is a, abounding in mercy creates life. But notice how is this life affected? The text tells us it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the powerful act that is brought about because of His great mercy. And it's that which gives us a living hope. A living hope. The hope of our own resurrection with Jesus Christ. We live because He lived. Our hope eternal alongside our resurrected Savior. Our hope is anchored in the past. Jesus rose. Our, our hope is anchored or remains in the present because Jesus lives. And our hope is completed in the future because Jesus is coming again. We have hope of salvation, hope of life, and hope of eternal life, all because of the resurrection. So it's His mercy that has caused us to be born again to living hope. This is interesting because we saw in the death of Christ that we have eternal hope, a hope that when we die, we would be justified before God through His death 
we are assured of his justification. But what we see here is that through his resurrection, we are assured of life, eternal life. Through his death, we are assured of atonement. Death assures us of our justification. Death assures us of our right standing before him. For he was crushed for our iniquities. But his resurrection assures us of his continued mercy upon us for all of life. 1 Corinthians says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man death came, but a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made life. You see, mercy gives life where death is deserved. The second understanding. Christ's resurrection guarantees God's promise. Notice the text tells us in verse 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, or reserved for you in heaven. If Christ were still in the grave, we would have no hope for the fulfillment of those promises. Christ tells his disciples that he's going away for a while in order to prepare a place for you. And if Christ was still in the grave, we would have no hope of that promise. But his resurrection assures us, or guarantees us, God's promises. In John 14, he says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And he says, I'll ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. I will not leave you as orphans, he says. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Those promises are guaranteed for us. I remember taking my children to Ushaka Marine World. We, uh, we, we, are, we are homeschooled. So what we do is, the day that everybody else goes back to school, we go to Ushaka. It's us and about 15 other people. It's great. Went to Ushaka and I took my little nine-year-old, who's now nine, she was much younger then, and we took one of those, those tunnels, that, those super tubes you jump in. And it's just, you jump in, this, and it's just like this black hole. And we said, come, come, Tembi, let's go, let's go jump in. And she was like, eh, eh, not going to happen. No ways. She refused. It was just a black hole. And she was convinced that this is just not going to work for her. So, you know, gracious dad, instead of throwing her in like I should have, I, I went around with her to the bottom. And as she's standing at the bottom of the super tube and she's looking, her brother pops out. She goes, oh, he didn't die. <laughs> Look, then the next one came out. And then the next one came out. And as they started popping out on the other side of this black hole, she was convinced that she could do that as well. Because she saw them overcome. And that's in the same way what we go through. Even though we are told by Christ that we would be fine. What we needed to see was to see life on the other side. And then all of the promises to us through Christ are affirmed to us through His resurrection. When He's raised from the dead, we know that we have certainty of His promises concerning our own resurrection. We too would come out on the other side. That death is just a doorway for us. In fact, that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And what does it say? And if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and our faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that He raised Christ 
Whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is, what does the word say? Futile. Empty. Without meaning. And he says, we've been raised to this inheritance. We're raised to an inheritance that is of such great value that it's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, reserved for you in, in heaven. And Peter can't describe what this inheritance is, so he tells us what it's not. And uses these four adjectives to allow us to know what it is. He says, it's imperishable, it's incorruptible. These heaven riches are not something that are subject to the passing or, or the undergoing decay. It's not going to disappear. It's going to be there forever. The heavenly inheritance does, does not contain the very seeds of decay and destruction because it's heavenly. It's also undefiled. The, the root word for undefiled literally means to, to paint over or to, or to stain. And for this heavenly inheritance is totally free of stain or blemish. It's uncontaminated by any form of sin. And, and another idea was that since this is an undefiled inheritance, it's incapable of being enjoyed by a polluted soul. We, we know that we will enjoy it, its fullness and it's holy. It's unfading. Think of flowers in the garden that so easily disappear. My wife and I have what they call brown fingers. Whenever we touch a plant, it dies. We, we can't get a plant to grow. Just, just the other day, I threw away a bunch of false flowers because they too died in my home. <laughs> but this is not true of heaven. They, they don't. Our inheritance will be as beautiful tomorrow as it is today. It's never going to go away. Peter is seeking to describe the glory and the majesty of our inheritance. And then he says this, what at the end there? Kept for you, reserved for you, guarded for you, kept under lock and key. The kept here refers to a past action. God, God, Christ has done something. And as a result of that, he's reserved for us something. And what he's done is the resurrection has guaranteed us that he will bring it about. It's true. Thirdly, Christ's resurrection undergirds our protection. That is verse 5. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Because He lives, we know that He's able to protect us. Christ, in one of the most significant passages in, in John's Gospel, in John's Gospel from verse 16, or chapter 16, sorry, onwards, is what we call the high priestly prayer. It's when Christ takes the time to pray for His disciples. And if you read through that prayer, you understand that the, the gist of His prayer is He prays to Father, Father, protect them, Father, keep them, Father, guard them, Father, allow the Holy Spirit to be a part of them. Give them that security because I'm going for a little while. They need to be protected because I'm not going to be with them. This is protection. Christ wants to protect those who are in Christ. Folks, how would that prayer that Christ prays have been nullified or would have, how, how would it have been devoid of power? if Christ was still in the grave. What assurance of protection would the believers have in days of persecution that they can overcome persecution, they can overcome these trials, they can continue to have hope if Christ was still dead in the grave? No, no, it is His resurrection from the grave that guarantees them of the protection that Christ Himself prayed for. When, when you are going through trials, when you are enduring hardship, when your faith is being tested, when things on this world are just overwhelming, 
The only hope that we have is the hope that is founded on the resurrection because the resurrection guarantees us of our protection that He will reveal to us in the last day. We will live and enjoy that. It's guarded, revealed that salvation. Having been saved from the guilt of sin, we trust, when we trust in our Savior, we were saved. When we are being saved, oh, through the power of sin, but we will be saved because of His resurrection. This is the most glorious idea and speaks of a final salvation when we are saved. And fourthly, Christ's resurrection inaugurates God's glory. I love this passage. It's uh, verse 6 onwards. Just just think about this now. I want you to to think of the persecution they were going through, the the suffering that they were going through, chased from their homes, loss of jobs, husbands, wives, children being killed just for the gospel. (laughs) And Peter writes this. In this you rejoice. What? What? Rejoice. In this you rejoice, though for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. It's like, what? So that the tested genius of your faith, more precious than gold, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and the glory and the honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice that. We rejoice because we understand that at the end of all of this, Christ, who has been resurrected, is glorified. And Christ is lifted up. Uh, Sometimes I lack joy. Sometimes I go through things in this world where I just have no joy. In fact, my, my wife and I have been studying this we, you, you can pray for us. We have, we have five teenagers in the home currently. And as a result of that, joy is in short supply in our home. And we ask ourselves the, this question over and again. What does it mean? The Bible says the, the, the fear of the Lord or, or the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord. What does that mean? I have joy. What does that mean? The joy of the Lord is my strength. And yet, yet how it fleshes out. I can have joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength because I know that Christ has been resurrected and whatever I'm going through in this world is for my good, for my sanctification. And because He has been resurrected, I too one day will be resurrected and I can rejoice in that. I don't rejoice in trials and sufferings. I'm not some weird martyr. They go, oh, oh, afflict me, afflict me, Lord, give me more pain, give me more pain. No. But I know that as I go through this life, I have joy because one day I will be with Christ because He Himself has been raised. And I'll be with Him for all of eternity. And we're all going to sing together, glory, 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 holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty because He lives. And that fuels me. It gives me hope in this world. As we experience the risen Savior, as we know the power of the resurrection, we are able to live lives that though being tested, results in His glory. And so what the author tells us in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, therefore because we have such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race, Let us get rid of all that sin that so easily clings to us and causes us to trip up. But let us run the race with our eyes focused on Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And That that Jesus Christ who, who gave his life for us rose from the grave and therefore I can rejoice that one day I will be with him for all of eternity. The resurrection assures them of God's victory, assures them of God's ultimate glory. I love that passage when uh, Peter in his sermon in Acts 
tells them, uh, 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 if you read Acts chapter 2, we read, read it this week as well, Acts chapter 2, he says to them, men of Israel, listen, pay, pay attention, this Jesus Christ, whom, whom you murdered, <laughs> by God's plan, whom you murdered, this Christ, he says at the end, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promises of the Holy Spirit that He has poured out to you this day. This, this revelation of Christ. When Christ is revealed again, our lives may be great instruments of glory. As, as He comes down, I just look along that. As Christ comes down and we see Him in His blazing glory, those of us that have loved Him and served Him will be part of that glory. Altogether, that scene in Revelation, who is worthy, who is worthy to take up the cross, to open the scroll, sorry. We see Christ. Christ is worthy. You see, Christ's resurrection demonstrates for us God's mercy. Christ's resurrection guarantees us God's promises, undergirds for us God's protection, and inaugurates God's glory. Now, what does that mean to us? What are some of the implications that we can draw from that text this morning? What are the, some of the things we can go home with and, and speak over as the week goes along? Well, first of all, believer, let's live our lives acknowledging His mercy. Let's, let's live our lives acknowledging His great mercy, that He has caused us to be born again because of His resurrection. Let's live lives holding on to the promises. God hasn't promised us health, wealth, and prosperity this side of eternity. But He's promised us all of those things for eternity. Let's hold on to that. Let's live resting in His protection, knowing that no matter what I go through, no matter what I endure, God is faithful and God can overcome because we saw him overcome in the resurrection. And let's live seeking his glory daily. Let us live our lives, even as we go through trials and persecution, that he who has conquered the grave is glorified in our lives. What's that great hymn that we sing? Because he lives, what's the next words? I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. May that be our heart cry this Easter morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the great promise, the great glory, the great announcement of the resurrection. We thank you, Lord, that we do indeed serve a risen Savior. And I pray that his resurrection, that the truth of his life, would, would undergird our lives. That, that we would live God-honoring, God-glorifying, God-exalting lives because He lives. We pray this in His mighty name. Amen. Well, I think there's...